I'm excited to be here and I'm pleased to be able to share um, a bit on a subject that I'm really passionate about. I've spoken on before and probably some of you have may have seen some of these pieces um, when I've spoken about them before. But it's a way for me to really give you a look inside our archives and some of the fantastic pieces that we have in our archives, in particular from prisoners of war. So with that, um, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see, so that we can have a look at some of the items. So here we go. Um, this, what you see here is the cover of a diary from a prisoner of war in Europe. And my research into this topic began about 10 years ago when I was preparing to curate a special exhibit at the museum called Guest of the Third Reich, American POWs in Europe. And so this is a, I, um, here you see Guest of the Third Reich. Um, this was on display at the museum from no November 2012 to July 2013, and it covered all aspects of American POW life in the European theater. So not just the journals, but the journals were indeed a really fantastic source of information about POW life. And the title, Guest of the Third Reich, might seem a little strange, but that indeed was taken from a diary. So you see here, this is a diary from a man named uh, Major Newton Cole, and he was a POW in the camp Oflag 64 in Schuben. Um, and so he was captured on June 19th, 1944, and he says, this damn yank became a guest to the Third Reich. And that's something that, you know, uh, that really surprised me when I started um, researching into these prisoner of war uh, manuscripts, diaries, is that they're sometimes really funny or ironic, or they use terms that, um, you know, that are really pretty humorous. And I think that um, it shows how much humor was needed and employed to sustain life while a POW. So Guest of the Third Reich is really one of the only one of the expressions that people, that prisoners of war in Europe used to refer to themselves. Another fantastic one um, from a man that I'll introduce you to later. Um, he referred to himself as a victim of German hospitality. So again, you know, that's, that shows that sort of, um, to see the, the humor in what is a very dark situation. So who are these individuals? So here you see a map of all of the prison, prisoner of war camps in Germany. And this is a map that was used by the American Red Cross, um, primarily for families of prisoners of war. So they could get a sense of where their loved ones were being held. And some of the major camps here are circled on the map. Um, there's Stalag Luft One, which we talked about just a few weeks ago, that's at the very top on the Baltic Sea. That's where um, uh, Mr. James Bainham was held and we spoke with him on VE Day. So, you know, here are some of the camps in, in Germany and there were large facilities and spread quite across. So overall, American POWs, we had around 120,000 American POWs um, throughout the war, and that's Europe and the Pacific. But you'll see from this chart, from this very simple chart, that the overwhelming number of prisoners of war were held in the year. There are around close to 93,000. And um, the death rate among those men were, um, the death rate was around 1%, so around 1,100 men perished while held captive. So if you happen to um, make it into a camp where there were other Americans and within the German camp system, you were, um, your chances of survival were pretty good. It was not so in the Pacific theater, and that there were a lot of factors behind that. I'll talk about some. 
but um, the death rate was around for American POWs in the Pacific was around 40%. So it was, you know, radically different. Um, and we'll dive into why a little bit. So, so the artifacts that we have in the collection, we also have um, a fantastic and, and growing collection of artifacts related to prisoners of war in the Pacific. And, but the character of those items is often very different from what you'll see today. So one of the main reasons behind POW survival in Europe was the protection of the Geneva Conventions. So the protection um, in relative to the treatment of prisoners of war and what was outlined. Now, Germany typically adhered to the principles of the Geneva Convention in relation to American POWs. It wasn't such with, with all nations. Um, the death rate among um, Soviet POWs was, was very, very high, around 60%. So, you know, here we're talking about American POWs held in German hands. And um, they were afforded a lot of protection from um, the Geneva Convention enforced by the International Red Cross, by the American Red Cross. And there were certain things that, um, that were outlined in those regulations. And that is um, Americans were, and this image that you see here is from a booklet called, If You Should Be Captured, These Are Your Rights. And that was distributed to, um, to American airmen. Um, and, you know, very, simple outline. It's a little tiny booklet with these sort of cartoonish drawings, but it outlines some of the principles of the convention. Like if you're captured, you are um, to only required to tell the enemy your name, rank, and serial number. You are allowed to elect representative among um, the American POWs. That's was referred to as the man of confidence, who's really an, an arbiter or um, you know, to, to take grievances to the German camp system. So an, an, a, an elected representative, that's the man of confidence. And then labor, American officers, allied officers were not required to um, work under the Geneva Convention. And that was both a good and, and bad thing as you'll see later. And then mail, you were allowed to, um, notify your family that you were being held. So that, those are things that, that often did not happen in the Pacific theater. Um, many families did not know for a long time um, whether or not their loved ones were dead or alive um, and in enemy hands. So of course the treatment of American prisoners of war in Europe varied um, drastically depending on um, the situation in the war, the date in the war, as, as the war progressed um, and there were more POWs and as the Germans began to, um, to lose the war, um, the situation was um, worse for American POWs. There was less food to go around overall, um, but also depending on who captured you, um, that, that really um, uh, affected your treatment going forward. But the Geneva Convention really was, and the American Red Cross, the International Red Cross, was the main factor in POW survival in the European theater. So here you see, this is an incredible picture. You can see two men standing working on top of a pile of crates. Um, and this is a Red Cross warehouse in Geneva. So this was a central stockpile of, um, of supplies that were distributed through the German camp system to allied POWs. And the effort was really enormous. In terms of American volunteers, um, we had more than 13,000 American volunteers working to put together parcels that were then distributed um, through the Red Cross. So giant, a, a gigantic effort, um, 27 million packages were distributed overall. And that's you know, an astounding figure 
how they were distributed, you know, it really, and, and how many made their way into POW hands is, is a figure that, that over time, but a, a tremendous amount of aid did filter through. And, and that's pretty astounding that they allowed this aid to, to continue throughout the war. And this is an artifact that we have in the museum's collection. Sometimes artifacts are pretty simple, like, like a cardboard box, but you know, a box can tell us a lot. So this is a, one of the prisoner of war food packages that would have been distributed through that warehouse system um, into the camps. And they contain canned goods and, and such, but then also other things like these journals. So this journal here, the, a wartime log is printed on the cover. Um, these were printed by the YMCA, the War Prisoners Aid of the YMCA, and they were distributed through the Red Cross. So there was a partnership there. Um, we were not exactly sure, a tremendous number of, of these were printed, probably around um, 21,000 of these were printed. And initially it was thought that that would be enough for every POW, um, every American POW. Of course, that was not nearly the case. So not everyone had, was given one of these. Um, many people did have them. We're not sure how many of them survived. There are certainly many still out there in the hands of families, and we have a nice collection at the National World War II Museum, predominantly um, due to families who've shared them with, with us. So this is one example. You see on the cover, there's um, the Liberty Bell. So this is, these are pre-printed blank journals. There were a series of them. The American, um, the War Prisoners Aid of the YMCA printed these. There was also the British War Re Prisoners Relief Society. Um, and this is that version here, which is about half the size of the American version. And there's also a Canadian version there with the, the maple leaf. Uh, but they're very similar in character and their purposes were the same. Um, Essentially, they were blank diaries for prisoners to use while they were in the camp to record anything that they wanted to record in terms of um, drawings, sketches, illustrations, um, list, names. So all of these things were fair game. And I'm going to show you, this is one example from one of the museum's um, diaries. And this is here, an illustration, this is from Sam Moore, who is held in Stalag Lafour. And you can see the calendar pages floating by. So he said, you know, the days from February 22nd, 1944 to April 29th, 1945 have been the longest, dreariest, most wasted days of my life. And, you know, he filled in the days of his liberation because it was really uncertain. And fighting the, not fighting the calendar was one thing that you'll see in other, um, other examples of these diaries. But you know, it's really a fight against the clock and that for, for POWs, for officers, allied officers who were not required to work, um, fighting the clock and not knowing you know, the uncertainty of when you would, when the war would end, when you would be liberated was really excruciating. So um, Sam Moore also said um, that he, he put a little preface to his diary and he said this was a collection of cartoons, poems, pictures and prose intended to portray the lighter side of any of prison camp life in Germany. If in the future it brings happy remembrances of buddies and chuckles to my friends and myself, then its purpose will have been well served. So all of these diaries came with instructions as to how to use them. Um, the, you know, there was a table of contents that you could fill in. And then the center of these diaries was, was very different it, it, where the paper consistency was more, um, was rougher, thicker, 
um, paper that people could use to paste um, images, to paste newspaper clippings, or even photographs into. These diaries also came with colored pencils in the back, and, um, and they were all kept and used right in the prison camps. So the question that often comes up is, you know, people were allowed to keep these diaries, and they were. Um, because it was something to do, it was actually something to keep them busy and out of the hair, I guess, of the captors. So let's look into some other examples. So a lot of the diaries contain um, thank yous to the American Red Cross and the YMCA. And you'll see here, this is Walter Boychuk's log, and he was in Stalagluft 1. And he wrote in appreciation to the Red Cross and the YMCA. And the Red Cross was responsible for um, additional food, additional nourishment. So the German, German camp system did provide food for the POWs, but the additional food that they received through the Red Cross was a real lifesaver. And often that was stockpiled among the American POWs themselves and then distributed um, to the various blocks and then rooms. Um, so the Red Cross was, was responsible for that food. They were also responsible for the mail. Um, so another real life-saving um, uh, institution, I suppose, um, for POW life was being able to communicate with your family that you were okay, that, that you were thinking about them, and to be able to hear from them at home. Um, and they were also responsible for medical needs, for medicine. The YMCA, um, on the other hand, was responsible for religious supplies, for educational supplies, and for recreational supplies. And some of the camps within the German system had tremendous libraries. They had 30,000 volumes in Stalagluft 3 that were passed around from POW to POW and read over and over again. Um, the, um, there were also schools that were set up among the POWs, barbed wire universities, and they taught each other subjects that um, you know, they were proficient in. And then recreational supplies. So these journals fall under, I guess, recreational supplies. Um, and, but there were also, there was sport equipment that was distributed. Um, there was, in, in the film Stalag 17, you see the ping pong balls, right, that come through. But there were other, you know, there was sports equipment um, and also musical instruments that were distributed to the camp. So there was a rich cultural life in some of the camps. And you see that, reflected in a lot of these diaries. You see evidence of these. I also want to say that, um, and I'll point you to this resource, and, and maybe Chrissy already has, but um, several of these diaries were digitized in back in 2012 and can be seen on our website. So we do have a bit more that you can view after this webinar. But we're still receiving new diaries, and this is one that this is our latest acquisition in terms of um, a prisoner of war diary. And this one has been digitized. Um, and so this is a diary from First Lieutenant Harold Rahm, who was in Stalagluf 3. And you can see here, this is a great example of the first couple of pages of what this diary looked like. Um, and so, you know, a lot of Ill interesting illustrations. You see the wings, the aerial gunner's wings, and um, with the ball and chain. You see um, a parachute, an airman coming down in a parachute and a, and a crashed airplane. So Harold Rahm, was shot down April 17, 1943. And there's also more information that you can find out about Harold Rahm online. And you'll see some images from, some more images from his diary later. So there are a lot of central themes that emerge in this genre of prisoner of war diaries from Europe. You see, um, and you've already seen some, um, there are a lot of images of flight, aircraft, of bailing out, 
Um, and that's because many of these prisoners had been forced out of their airplanes in combat. So they had been down by flak. They had been blown out of their planes. Um, in 1943, there was an average of 400 bailouts per month. So that's a lot of potential um, POWs, a lot of potential diarists here. There are also, um, as you can expect, a lot of memorials memorials to those on those crews who did not make it. The number one topic of conversation in prisoner of war camps, um, and that's almost across the board, uh, was food. So you see a lot of references to food. Some of the diaries function essentially as cookbooks because they're just list and list of food. Uh, also, many of them feature poems, songs, and various lists of other kinds. There are a lot of tributes to the Red Cross. There are what I call roll calls, which are, you know, lists of, of other men who were in the camp with them. And then there are references to dreams and the future. And these are just some central themes. They, um, the diaries in the museum's collection, which number around, um, 30 in all, probably from the European theater, maybe a little more, um, are, are all very different. Some people decided to record a straight narrative of what their time in the camp was like. Others just illustrated all day long. Others wrote poems the entire time. So, you know, there was really, really different. Others are, are like scrapbooks. And you'll see some of the examples as we move through. So. This one is from Joseph Baronek um, and one of his crew on um, Sky Queen, I believe it was, um, J, Lieutenant J.L. Ryan was killed when the went down. So here is a lovely example um, of a memorial to a friend. This one is from the diary of Walter Boychuk. It's in memory of the boys who've given their lives in the fight to all of us, to all of them from all of us, may their wings still shine in airmen's heaven. And then this one is from a paratrooper, Ed Shaw. He writes a poem, My Buddy. And again, this is a memorial for his buddy who died. So these diaries are not all funny, of course. They are um, kept by individuals who have often survived very traumatic um, situations, either in their, their bailout or in their capture or beyond, or in combat prior. So the diaries often begin, you can see this one's on a page five of a diary. Um, they often begin with um, an example of how the prisoner ended up in that situation. And here, shot down November 13th, 1943, Bremen. Here is another one. Um, you'll see it's referred to as CHOP. So that's when they were um, bailed out of the plane, shot down August 13th, 1944. And this is an interesting idea, the Caterpillar Club. So the Caterpillar Club's members um, shared the distinction of um, having their lives saved by a parachute. So they survived the jump. And that was something you could um, write a parachute company and um, apply for membership and you were given a membership card and, and often a pin. So the Caterpillar Club is a distinction that many of these airmen um, were a part of. And then you see more somber, um, even scary um, drawings of people being falling free from a plane here, B-17. And 
and then you know dog fights here so lots you know this theme is very clear across the board here are some other great examples and this is good on a lot of levels because you can see the um this is the interior of the volume the scrapbook page essentially in the center um, and this is from Harold Rahm's diary. And you can see Donald Duck was a figure that, come, that came through, um, that appears in several of these um, logs. And this is at once an, a reflection of how Harold Rahm ended up in the camp. Happy landings, ground floor all out. And then the diary on the left is Harold Rahm's diary, um, Stella Glyph 3. You can see um, Donald Duck is there holding up his, what is a POW ID tag. So that has his number on it, which I can't quite make out. Um, but the diary on the right is from Chet Strunk, Chester Strunk. Um, and you can see see a, another variation on that I wanted wings and that was you know a POW insignia POW patch um, essentially and that appears in lots of different diaries and it brings up an interesting point that you know many of these diaries contain very very similar illustrations there were certainly um, illustrations that were passed around that were traced that were copied um, freehand so it's it's interesting to see how they appear across the board what these men were both in style with three so that makes sense but there are variations of these in other camps and it's really interesting to see how information was shared among pow's in within one camp and then um, across the board so here we get to one of the main subjects Food. So this covers both Red Cross and food because to um, the POW's right, you can see there's an open Red Cross package. And then here he is cooking with a blower. This is from Ed Shaw again, and he was in Stalag 7A, which is in Mosburg, which became the largest American POW camp in Europe at the end of the war. Um, and as many um, prisoners from other camps were were driven there at the end of the war ahead of the Allied advance. So you can see um, this prisoner is using a contraption they call the GI blower. And we actually have a replica of one of these in the collection that someone made. Um, so, uh, you know, another great um, component of these diaries is it shows us a lot of the ingenious inventions that. POWs came up with to make life bearable. And so the GI blower or the GI cooker was exactly one of those. And then here again, this is from Shaw's diary again, dividing the Red Cross parcel. So you can see the prisoners here at their table in their barracks, dividing up the food, sharing the food that was distributed to them. And then this is interesting, these illustrations here. So the diary on the left is Sam Moore again, who you met earlier, the one with the calendar. And um, so he, here you see POWs trying to divide a loaf of bread, chop it, saw it, butter it, eat it if you can. Um, and then on the right, this is from an illustration from a man named George Basil. Um, and he was in style with three. And here you see the prisoners um, performing complicated equations, um, trying to um, divide up this dessert for eight. So the division of food is um, a big topic in these diaries as well. And here you see, this is from Chet Strunk's log, the charm, that's the American Red Cross package and the contents. So lots of things that you would expect that are very durable, spam, jam, corned beef, prunes. Um, and so that's the content of one package. And again, you see the box that we referred to earlier and the life-saving um, contributions of the American Red Cross. 
again, this is from a totally different book. This is Newton Cole's diary, again, OFLOG 64, our guest of the Third Reich. Um, he outlines the contents of the number nine package, and that's very similar, salmon, liver pate, corned beef, so all of these things, and they use them in the communal kitchen in OFLOG 64. Now this is a fantastic, this is one of my favorite examples. So you see a lot of different recipes. This is from Joseph Baronek's um, diary. And he outlined all of these different recipes of things that you can make with the ingredients from Red Cross parcels. And this was a very common um, thing for POWs to put in their diaries. And so one of my favorite recipes is the one for bread pudding. Of course, being here in New Orleans, bread pudding is a very special thing. Uh, but the last little instruction on this recipe is my favorite, eat if eatable, if not eat anyway. So you see very important instruction there. Food again, the number one topic of conversation. Uh, this is a Christmas dinner menu. Now this is from the British version. It's a little smaller. This was actually by a uh, Royal Air Force Air, uh, POW, Olaf Lambert, who settled in New Orleans. It's our only one from a British airman. And he was in Stalaglyph One, and you can see this is the Christmas dinner from 1943. It's a little more sophisticated. He uses the French term, pommes frites. Um, this menu here is from Stalaglyph Three. So, but again, you see a lot of the same ingredients. You see this is a Thanksgiving menu. You can see the turkey is um, made out of cans and cabbages, so the can of Spam figures prominently there, but this is, Jagan is where um, Stalag Le Three was, um, and it's the Jagan Country Club. So just a beautifully illustrated menu that's included in one of the diaries. Um, and the Country Club is made, you know, is in barbed wire script, which was really very beautiful. So another thing that you see in the diary is very common. Um, this is about food as well, but you know, where someone's dozing in his bed um, and you know, his wife perhaps, oh, his mom is saying, come Junior, breakfast is ready. Um, so any similarity between this picture and Stalag blah, 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 blah is purely coincidental. So this is also, I think from Sam Moore's diary. And, you know, so dreaming um, in the camps, dreaming about food, dreaming about home, what you would like to do when you get home is another big topic in these diaries. There are men who outline their first week of meals when they're free, um, and that's pretty entertaining as well. The, these 12 course meals that people want to eat when they, when they can. Now, some of the diaries I talked about, poems and narratives. So these are also things that you see across the board with a lot of these. Um, you see these similar poems. This one's called Draft Dodger. Um, and um, of course, not a real um, favorable look on um, draft dodgers. This one's called Kriegsgefangener Kelly. Kriegsgefangener is the German for POW and the look. These men were referred to themselves as Kriegis. Um, so Kriegsgefangener Kelly was a character that appears in some of these diaries as well. So here we see some list. Um, list of here in, in particular, it's sports. And I believe this is in style before but we have representatives from, so those are all of the nations that are represented in Seligloff for um, all of the sports that are played there, including, you know, skating, field hockey, um, softball, volleyball, basketball, and then roommates. So of course, roommates are um, very important aspects of these diaries. Books read at OFLOG 64. I think this is really, really interesting. You know, I mentioned some of the camps with their large libraries. 
But it's interesting to see what people, what they're reading in the camp and try to put yourself in their situation when they're reading, you know, perhaps escaping into a tree grows in Brooklyn, you know, or, um, you know, Madame Curie. Um, so it's really interesting. These were all read by Newton Cole. And some of these lists of books read in the camp, you know, are number in the hundreds. So the, here are two wonderful examples of um, list of fellow POWs. And this is where I think some of these diaries really are fantastic research search sources because there are you can use them to refer to each other. You can find, and I, and I have been able to find, even within the museum's collection, um, I have been able to cross-reference these diaries and find um, people listed in them. Now, it, you can't always do that. It's, it's exciting when it does happen, but um, some of these camps held 10,000 people. So, you know, it really depended on the time situation. But, but when you can um, find a reference to someone in another diary, it's, it's pretty exciting. Here we go. This is Sky Queen. So this is from Joseph Veronik. And you saw earlier the list um, the memorial to his navigator, J.L. Ryan. So this is the, the crew of Sky Queen that went down. And then here we are. This is just a beautiful illustration, um, I believe from John Lee's diary, and he was in Stalaglyph III. Um, there's Delmar Spivey, who was one of the heads of the camp. So this is a great illustration of the blockhead. So the, the blocks are the various um, uh, barracks, you know, are organized into blocks, and those are the blockheads. Sometimes the diaries contain um, the German POW ID cards, which were obviously acquired after liberation, but they, you know, a, it's sort of an addendum, I suppose, to the diary. And this is John Lee here, um, whose diary you just saw from Stalaglyph Three. The cards were taken um, when the camp was evacuated, and many of the POWs were able to acquire their German records right on site um, after liberation. Here's another beautiful example of POW addresses. So you can see all of these different men that um, made connections in the camp. And some of them did stay in touch with each other after liberation. Now, some of the diaries contain photographs and it's pretty interesting because, um, you know, you would think that, you know, some of the photographs were actually taken and developed in the camp which is amazing that that occurred, that people were able to access um, the equipment to do that. But some of the photographs were sent to them or even may, they may have had them with them. These were sent by the family of um, Joseph Veronik. And this is his daughter, Helen Ann. She's writing there on the chalkboard, um, Hi Daddy, Helen Ann. And so, um, there's actually a, a, a program that I conducted with Helen Ann. She gave this diary to the museum and we conducted a program together about this diary several years back. So other diaries, these are, at, that's actually two pages here that you see a two page spread, but this is more, this gives you more of the feel of the scrapbook kind of version of the diary. Um, the, this is from Newton Coles. So, he was in a flop 64, and here are some of the um, cigarettes. Now, I find it interesting because cigarettes were the main, one of the main um, currencies within the camp. People could trade and barter with them, and they were very valuable. On the left is also cigarette paper. So, you know, maybe he entered, emptied the tobacco out and then, um, you know, kept those cigarette cigarettes on the right. Um, but gives you an idea of the way that he recorded his time as a prisoner. 
And then again, here are some others. So people sometimes um, kept currency. So the diary on the left is from Bruce Worrell. And um, so he had German currency and then also German newspapers on, on the right there. So I do want to introduce you to Chet Strong. So this is a diary that was really pretty special to me because I got to know Chet Strunk. So out of all of these, predominantly we received them at least within the last 13 years from um, the children of, of POWs or the families, grandchildren even in some instances. But this diary was received from Chet Strunk himself and his family. Um, so this is his POW ID card from Style of Three. And there he is, right there on the second from the right, Mr. Chet. And this was several years ago. He has since passed on. So we're very fortunate to have met him, to have talked with him. We have his oral history on the website, which I'm sure you'll be pointed to. This is Chet and his family and his neighbors. So I'll give you, I was able to you know, one of the reasons it was so special is that Mr. Chet was very generous with his time and um, walking us through, walking me through the diary. We went through every page together with his family and talked about it and what it meant and how he got it. So this is funny. This is a page in Chet Strunk's diary from Stalaglyph 3. And you can see he's taped it back together. Um, now, he was afraid that he would get in trouble for this illustration of Hitler and, and sort of losing the war, beginning to lose the war. Um, but um, so he ripped it out and he kept it hidden away. Um, but he pasted it back in later. So um, you know, the di diaries, people were afraid that the diaries would be censored or that they would be taken away. Um, so there's some self-censoring that went on, but not too much. Um, they're still, you know, a little, perhaps a little critical. Um, and then here you see the calendar again, the calendar pages. And this is pretty exciting because you can see what's happening in this period in Style of 3, um, right as the men were evacuated from the camp. But it's interesting also because Chet's, Chet's calendar here continues on. So there are pages that continue on into the future. He really did not know when he was going to be liberated. There's also a map here of the South Camp of Stalaglyph III. It was a great map illustrator. There's a map of his hometown of Benton Harbor, Michigan, which he said he drew from memory. Um, and then a map of his sort of journey um, where he was shot down and where he ended up at Jagan. Another thing he was funny about was um, the vocabulary. So here you see um, victim of German hospitality is a Kriegi. But you know, the, in the camps, they developed sort of their own language, which was a mishmash of 1940s slang of um, military um, terms of you know, it's really pretty interesting. So I think these are powerful research um, pieces because they document the everyday life in camps. You can draw comparisons to um, the situation in different camps. They sometimes illustrate the uh, POW life. And then um, we can connect people through the material. So the museum's collection contains diaries from all of these different camps and many, you saw many illustrations from many of these diaries. They are not all digitized. So unfortunately, I couldn't show you all of them. Some of them have come in recently. The goal, of course, is to digitize this material and to make it available for research. Um, but uh, that takes quite a long time. These are often very fragile items that need very careful handling. So Harold Rahm's diary is the latest to have been digitized and we're um, going to present that online as soon as we can. There are also others that we can, we have in the collection 
mainly from Stahlglyph One, and this is interesting, that were done by um, MCA. And these were part of, they look like this. They're little sort of composition notebooks um, that are much smaller, um, soft covered, but we have quite a number of these that were also distributed by the YMCA. Now, this is a fantastic resource. Um, it's not available through the museum store at the moment, but it is um, available online, I believe, through Amazon. It talks about the ideas of these, and I have used a lot of um, research through from this volume um, in my decade of work with this, with these really incredible items. So we continue to work with them at the museum and we'll continue to digitize these and bring them to you and on our website. Um, and also at the moment, you can check out the ones that we have digitized online at guestofthethirdreich.org. And I think that link will be provided in the chat. So I know that was a, a lot of information. I would love to um, get to some questions right now. So there are a lot of really good questions here. Um, surprised that the Germans allowed the logs to be distributed. Um, and, and, you know, I think that it was, it was somewhat similar in that any activity that a prisoner of war, um, that distracted a prisoner from, you know, trying to escape was looked upon favorably. So if that meant, you know, there was a volleyball court or a basketball court or, you know, that someone was um, reading a book or writing a, you know, drawing in their journal, that was taking someone away, distracting someone from pr trying to escape. Um, so I think that, you know, that was something that, um, so I haven't heard of, um, some of the logs being confiscated so prisoners couldn't send messages to resistance fighters outside the camp. I haven't um, heard of that happening. I, it could have very well, but, um, but yeah, I haven't, I don't know of any instances of, of that occurring. Um, You know, what do we know about PTSD? Um, you know, even just in a presentation a few weeks ago on VE Day, um, we talked with Jim Bainham, former POW in Stella Glyph One, and he talked about some of the trauma that he suffered and um, after the war and how he, um, you know, it's taken him a long time to be able to talk about it. And you know, I think that is a very underrepresented um, area of um, discussion. And so we certainly would, you know, would like to bring that um, up more and more. Were there any romance stories that I've found in my research? No, other than um, what I have so Chet Strunk, you know, people um, write a lot about their um, hopes and dreams for the future. So Chet Strunk, you know, talked about, wrote a, about wanting to propose to his wife. So, so that's, you know, certainly a, a romance story. Um, what about religion in these diaries? So religion does play a part and there were um, religious services that took place in some of the camps. and um, and those are often, you know, written about in the diary. So, you know, just it depended on um, the particular person and whether or not they were particularly religious. Um, I see some, uh, another comment here, how were Jewish American POWs treated by the Germans? So that varied um, in, by camp, camp to camp. So it, um, you know, to, in Stalag Lafour, the situation was pretty dire, and some 
Jewish American POWs were actually sent to a slave labor camp of Berga, and we have some research about that on our website. Um, in um, Stalaglyph three, um, in Stalaglyph one, they were actually segregated out, um, and that was terrifying. But that came to no end. Um, so they were they were treated in many instances like. Um, the other POWs, the other non-Jewish American POWs, but there was always a fear there that they would be singled out because of their religion and persecuted. Um, there are a lot of questions. So, um, did the logs discuss the type of medical treatment given to the wounded prisoners? Not so much. Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, what's the most surprising thing I've seen in a diary? I think the photographs are pretty surprising when you see photos that were taken and developed within the camp. Um, that's pretty surprising. We also have a diary that was, um, from the Man of Confidence in Stalaglyph 4. So it's exciting to have a diary from someone who was held a, a little bit of a position of power, let's say, in the American camp, and that's Willard Miller, and his diary is digitized online. And he was actually given his diary by um, Chris Christensen, who was the YMCA representative who visited the camp. So that's pretty exciting. They're all, you know, um, really unique and the stories within them are you know it's it's pretty exciting to turn the page and and see what you're going to find um certainly during the last year of the war the german camp guards um, may have taken some of the red cross supplies so you know it it depended on um the camp administration it depended on the strength of your um your American unit, you know, how, how um, virulently you could um, argue for yourself. It depended on the situation in the war. So um, when, you know, towards the end of the war, no one had any food, the transportation system had broken down and, um, and you know, things were, were not good. So I think at that period, many of the diaries were um, were left behind, were burned for um, fuel, you know, so, so it's really, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how many of these um, survived the war, but it's exciting to see that there are more out there and learn about them. There are some others that you can view online at, up from other sources. So, um, so yeah, I want to thank you all um, for participating, for hanging in there with all of these illustrations. I want to encourage you to, um, to look at more on our website and um, continue to stay tuned to our website because we continue to talk about these, write about these, and present them online. So um, thank you again and be well. <laughs>